Good morning. That, that, that's part of the point. Helps to get everybody's attention. <laughs> Happy Friday. Given that it is the month of Halloween, it would be appropriate that we cover a scary topic like cybersecurity. Before handling, handing it over to the panel, um, I'm Mike from TechPoint, by the way. I've met many of you uh, in the past. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to welcome the folks that are joining us remotely as well. We have folks in uh, sites in South Bend and Elkhart um, at Barnes and Thornburg offices, and then also the Purdue Technology uh, Center in Northwest Indiana, Merrillville, and the Mid America Science Park in Scottsburg. So, welcome everybody, um, and to all those in the room here uh, as well. Thanks to BNC as always for being gracious hosts and providing breakfast, and to Lightbound as well to help, that helped to make this event possible. And um, I'll spotlight just a couple things. Um, we have coming up next Friday, um, Entrepreneur Boot Camp. Um, and Angie Hicks, Mark Hill, Dustin Sapp, CEO of Tinderbox, um, uh, a couple Mira Award winners from this past year, the guys from Double Map, which were, took home two Mira Awards, and also Chris Palmer from BoxFox will all be part of that. So. Um, it's going to be it's going to be f uh, filled up here shortly. So if you haven't registered and if that's of interest to you, please do. Uh, it will be up at Launch Fishers on the northeast side. And then also October 16th Tech Thursday um, is going to be at Angie's List. We're taking it on the road, and it's going to be the CTO, the new CTO uh, from Angie's List, who they recruited away from Saber. Um, so those of you who have booked a plane ticket online, uh, <laughs> you have him to thank for that. Um, he is going to be speaking. Um, so that will be a really interesting topic uh, coming up as well. Um, as I highlighted before at last, last week, Mira is the earliest that it's been, Joshua probably ever. Uh, on March 21st coming up, uh, Mira applications will open up in November and the due date will plan to be January uh, 14th. Uh, so make sure that you're, you've got that slotted as well. Okay, enough of the announcements. I'm gonna turn it over and, and also just a housekeeping thing. Uh, you'll see note cards on the table in front of you. So. Um, if there are particular questions that you have, jot them down on the note card, hold them up. Somebody from one of our teams will uh, pick them up and bring them up to Brian so that he can cycle them into the conversation. Very good. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Brian is a lawyer here at BNC in the Internet and Technology Group uh, to introduce the panel. Thanks, Mike. appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Enjoy the uh, commute in this morning in the rain for the appropriately doomy and gloomy topic of uh, cybersecurity here. Um, Brian McGinnis, attorney here uh, at Barnes & Thornburg, um, practicing internet technology. I mean, our practice here, uh, or at least my practice here, is largely sort of at the intersection of technology and law. Uh, and so, you know, we, we work with a bunch of tech clients from sort of household internet names and software companies on down to local Indianapolis startups. And, uh, you know, increasingly we're seeing these issues come up at the front end. You know, we're getting data. What do we do with it? How do we store it? You know, privacy issues, all these things, uh, certainly as well as the back end. Uh, which I would consider to be, you know, all the breaches and everything else that seem to be uh, extremely popular uh, in the news today, popular in finger air quotes, right? Um, but uh, we got a ton of stuff to get to today. I'm sure we'll have a, a bunch of great questions, so let's jump in. Uh, next to me here on my left, we've got Nicholas Taylor. Nick is the COO and partner of NetLogix LLC, uh, which he founded in 1998 with his wife, Audrey Taylor. Uh, NetLogix is a high-performance consulting organization, and Nick leverages his 30 years of diverse IT experience to drive quality. He holds a project management professional and certified information systems security professional, CISSP certifications. He also holds the ISO 9000 lead assessor certification and has lectured extensively in quality management. Sounds very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's, yeah, I was going to say, Nick's originally from the UK, his IT background. Uh, began with insurance, finance, and payroll services, but after coming to the U.S., he has worked extensively uh, in a variety of industries, which include healthcare, insurance, baking, government, automotive, and utilities. Scott Morris, CTO <laughs> of Eskenazi Health, but as we, we talked earlier, they uh, don't let you print business cards because you have so many titles it wouldn't fit on it. So Chief Technology Officer for all divisions of the Health and Hospital Corporation, including Sydney and Lois Eskenazi Hospital, Eskenazi Mes Medical Group, the Eskenazi Foundation, Midtown Mental Health, the Marion County Public Health Department and Health and Hospital Headquarters Division, as well as the Indianapolis IEMS Ambulance Service. Anything else? 
Not today. All right, good. Uh, so Scott's got over two decades of experience in robotics research, data center design, disaster avoidance and recovery, planning, medical compliance, large-scale network design, business process re-engineering and health systems development, and he currently manages an engineering group of 40 staff and consultants. Uh, and finally, at the end, we have Vaughn Welch, who's the director of IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, the CACR. Uh, Vaughn specializes in cybersecurity for distributed systems, particularly scientific collaborations and federated identity. Vaughn's current roles include P&I director for the Center for Trustworthy Scientific Cyber Infrastructure, a project dedicated to helping NSF science projects with their cybersecurity needs, and the CSO of the Software Assurance Marketplace, a DHS-funded facility to foster software assurance and software assurance research. Good? Everybody hear me okay? I feel like the mic's kind of tweaking out on me. We're good? All right. All right, so uh, like any good lawyer presentation, let's start by scaring the hell out of everybody here. So a recent industry uh, um, study came out the last couple of weeks here. All right, I, I just find these numbers fascinating. We'll use this as a jumping off point. So within the past year, according to this study, 43% of companies have experienced a data breach. If you think that your company is too small or too new to have these issues or that this is an issue for a company, you're wrong. Increasingly so. Approximately 60% of those companies have suffered uh, at least more than one breach within just the last two years. This is something that is hitting everyone else. I think the title today is Cybersecurity, the New Normal. We'll, we'll certainly jump into that, but this really is uh, the new normal. These figures are up 10% from last year. 67% um, of the 567 executives surveyed uh, for this particular study said that they did not have a real understanding of what to do in the aftermath of a breach specific to losing customers. 67% of businesses don't know what to do when they find out, probably from Krebs on security or some other website that they have a breach. 62% of those confess to having no confidence on responding to a breach that involved intellectual property or proprietary business information. We don't know what to do, 62%. Three-fourths of companies stated that a breach uh, response plan was established, but 50% of the people who have one don't think it's up to par, and 17% were uncertain if the plans would work and as much as 30% came right out and said that the plans were completely ineffective. 567 executives of US companies were surveyed and 30% said complete garbage. The new normal, cybersecurity, welcome. Rain clouds rolling in. So Nick, what are you seeing in the major trends in the new normal? Let's kick it off there. Well, I, th I think what you just covered then um, actually is uh, only part of the story. So um, those numbers are garnered from people who actually have mechanisms in place to know that they've been uh, yeah. attacked. Um, the network, the, the internet, is, is basically scanned and trolled all the time. And, and probably even your own home network, your uh, connection to Comcast, periodically get somebody just uh, pinging it to see what's there and see if they can get inside it. Now that somebody might be, um, you know, script kiddies and things like that that are up to uh, interesting trying to figure out what's, what's what. But increasingly, and I'm sure Scott can uh, talk a little bit more about this, we, we as a, uh, a society are under attack from um, from very organized groups and whether it's organized crime and it is organized crime and it's coming from um, Eastern Europe and places like that and, and it's a very broad and deep network uh, where they, uh, re they actually recruit kids uh, because the kids are, are a damn sight better at uh, IT than most of us here. So, um, um, but it's also um, state-sponsored uh, attacks and um, I think Scott you might talk to that a little bit more on the um, uh, there's things that you've seen on, he on healthcare. Um, it's out there, and if you don't believe it, um, just wait, because it will be you. Um, because what's happening is people are essentially losing their identities. Uh, these, these mechanisms are garnering the information. They're taking it from a bit here and a bit there, and they kind of glue it together. Um, it's like the adage when they are 
uh, got a, one of the bank robbers in the 30s, and they said to him, so why do you rob the banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> so why would you go to uh, a hospital? That's because where all the identities are. And if you've got the identities, you can create um, uh, financial gains and, and other manip manip manipulations like that. It, it is like that all the time. This is the new normal. Yeah, let me go to Vaughn next, and then we'll jump into you guys and figure out sort of your particular roles in this in this battle. Vaughn, just sort of high-level overview here of, of the issues that people are facing and I guess the, the many, many different directions that these attacks are coming from and the issues. All right. Well, let me come at this a little bit from the different direction in terms of, you know, if we look at what we're doing right now with the Internet over the past 20 years, which has really exploded, and we've created arguably one of the most complicated systems humankind has ever made. It's not terribly surprising we haven't gotten everything right. And I don't know we ever entirely will, right? We still have police stations and fire stations around because, you know, what we try to do is we get risks down to an acceptable level. And right now we're really struggling with that because the technology is new, the international interactions are new, all these things. So we have legal policy and, te and technical work to do. And so, yes, right now we're very much in a stage where we don't quite know how to control what we've created. And, you know, you've mentioned all these, these numbers. You mentioned, Brian, about folks not knowing how to respond. <coughs> Ten years ago, if you went out and you talked to cybersecurity people, a lot of what you got was firewalls, pen, you know, stop them at the perimeter, prevention, prevention, prevention. And it's understood now the new normal today is you have a very high risk of being breached if not a certainty, and you better know how to respond. And so cybersecurity, from my perspective, the new normal is it's comprehensive. It's, you know, you need to do some prevention on the front end, but you better know how to make sure if something goes wrong, you know how to detect it, you know how to respond to it, you know how to handle your customers afterwards. So Scott, I think in a lot of ways you're sort of on the front lines here. What are you seeing? Where is it coming from? And, and uh, you know, in a large organization like yours, what are you left to do? Um, well, it's been kind of interesting because I think that you know, starting out, you know, kind of to echo Vaughn's point, um, you know, I think 10 years ago we talked especially in terms of, all right, the state actor thing is very romantic, but what you're really, what's really going to happen is you're going to get hit from inside. What has happened is, uh, what we see is you still have a tremendous risk from carelessness internal. But the state actor thing has really come up um, in terms of to what I would say is at least a parallel risk. Um, and in state actors, I put in that, you know, the obvious category and then kind of quasi governmental funded organized crime that you see come out of Eastern Europe and things like that. We had an interesting experience. Um, when we stood up some new data centers, we knew that, uh, I was curious to see how long it would take and we knew probably where those vectors would come from. So we started watching that, and it was about three weeks before um, IPs out of uh, state-run Chinese IPs started just pecking, just seeing, and you could see them walk through the IP addresses, seeing what they could find, just very, very slow. And about a year after that, we had a full-on, let's see if we can get something attack, where literally we had three engineers and myself sitting in a room, obviously, you know, it sounds like a movie, but you know, everything that they would do, we would try and get ahead of it. And that went on for a day, and then it just went away. Um, that was not a serious effort to get in and get anything. That was a, how good's your car alarm? Right. Do we want you now, or do we want to move on to the next one? And that's you know, kind of to Nick's point of, and the point of that article um, and our host, um, it really does kind of adhere to that car alarm principle is what we're seeing right now. Now the thing that brightens me is, is I'm assuming that we got kicked up to the next level. Um, so you graduated. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. I'm guessing we graduated to the next level. But the, uh, um, yeah, and it's like uh, it's like anything. It's like you know gymnastics in the '70s. If the state's willing to pay you and put your family through college and put you in a room for 12 hours and go, this is just what you do, and we'll give you every tool you can ask for. That's difficult to keep up with. Um, so I, I think that that's something that's been interesting to me in terms of what has evolved is you are seeing a lot more serious external threats with a lot more resources behind them 
And that's why I think you end up in the place kind of where Vaughn said is, it's not really an if you're going to get owned, you will eventually get owned. It's how you're going to react to that and how deep they get inside. So. Uh, now, Nick, what, what's sort of your role in the attacks here? Oh, well, I'm not carrying them out. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> although, um, although in, 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 um, in order to help organizations to understand what that looks like, that's actually what I do do. I, I go and I figure out how, to, uh, how, how an attack vector, vector might work. Um, sadly, the, the, the easy ways in are still the easy ways in. And um, most, most of the time, the, um, the easy way to, to work an organization is through uh, social engineering. Um, I've actually gone into hospitals. I, I, I'll tell you this real quick. I, there was a, a group of um, social workers. The, the C, CIO told me they were very secure, and I bet him that it, they weren't. Um, and so I went to see these uh, group of social workers, and... Uh, walked in, they didn't know who I was, I dressed up, clipboard, briefcase, and I walked up to this lady and I said to her, how did you get that laptop? Who gave you this laptop? You c that, that's not part of your grade. And uh, she said, I, 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 it was here when I came, I, 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 so I'm going to have to take it off you, I'm sorry. So I gave her a, a note, I wrote it down, gave her my name, phone number, I picked the laptop off, and I, I, said, I walked around and said, anybody else got one of these? They all shut them down. So I walked out with the laptop and it wasn't logged off. So um, those kinds of things are absolutely uh, possible. Um, people are also like to be very helpful. That If you ask them to show you to the data center, quite a lot of the time they'll do exactly that. Um, so my role is to really try and uh, evangelize about this. I, um, I'm very passionate about um, security. And if any of you people use Facebook, you should stop because the criminals use Facebook to garner the information about you. And if you ever have a, somebody sending you a survey that says, how well do you know Nick Taylor, and you fill out all the information, congratulations, you're helping them to do the same social engineering and collect those things. If you ever want to buy identities, Facebook's a good place to go and find them. They're, they're already out there. It's an abomination. Stop using it, people, really. Stop using it. Stop putting your personal information out on the internet if you don't expect it to be used against you. So for those of us who are not computer engineers in here, I'm picturing like Nick walking in with his briefcase and his black suit and Scott's like in front of some, uh, what's that movie, The Matrix screen where he's seeing all these pings come in and stuff like that from a technology base and you're beating back the, the Chinese attackers uh, with technology solutions. but. You know, if I'm hearing you, and based on our, our previous conversations, you know, where's the risk between you know high-end state attacks versus people giving away their passwords on Facebook or giving it to their friend or somebody taking or losing a laptop, uh, or you know, I think a lot of people don't realize, uh, like with a lot of the recent data breaches that we see in the news, for instance, Target or, or Jimmy John's, a lot of these aren't because Target is doing something wrong. They've got teams of people like Scott who are defending it. It's you know their their third party vendor for HVAC in the case of Target, um, like what Pennsylvania, yep. who isn't doing what they need to be doing from a security level, and they're able to access the entirety of the Home Depot system or the entirety of the Target system through this one little weak link in the chain. Um, so you know where is that? And for businesses who don't have teams of engineers to throw at this, uh, for businesses who would love to get a contract to Target to be able to do this, what kinds of things that can they do that are going to be able to show that they're responsible enough uh, and prepared to, to have these contracts and work with these larger organizations? So, uh, my number one thing would be talk to your larger organizations, because those of us who are in the larger organizations, we know nine times out of ten. If, if we've got an investment in security, one of our most dangerous vectors is our partners. And so it behooves us to assist you. It behooves us to take the phone call and say, schedule an hour and sit down and go, all right, why don't you do these minimal set of things? Um, you know, a lot of times your partners will assist you, particularly if you're small. Um, you know, so I think that that's really, to be succinct, uh, you know, that's one of those powerful things you can do. There's an interesting phenomenon that has happened um, with security, which is, it has been pushed down to the individual organizations and has been decentralized. So we have almost built a system where it's very, very difficult to be effective. 
And that's happened not through any particular malice. It's happened through certain uh, regulatory uh, and case law issues that started really in the late 70s with phone systems and things like that. Um, uh, and that's kind of rippled through to where uh, we really went to a, we're going to build this giant, super complex, distributed system, like Vaughn said, but we're going to make each individual node responsible for, regardless of their level of capability, responsible for meeting the highest level of security. I mean, so you almost guarantee, it, you know, the internet security as a whole is cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, um, if the, you know, across the, the greatest thing that we could do you know, uh, as a collective is exactly what we're doing right now, which is sit down, talk about this, figure out how we work together, because there's not going to, for a long time, be a large centralized, hey, let's run it through this pipe, and if we see this, you know, inbound address misbehaving from another country, let's shut it off. We're, we don't do that. So it's, you know, um, or at least we don't do it a lot. So let me go to Vaughn next. Where's, where's the research taking it? Uh, at this point in terms of best practices. Is, is CAPTCHA good enough for the entirety of the internet security? Well, Passwords, change your password every six weeks? So I, I think we're, we're seeing research pushing on a number of different fronts. And quite frankly, I don't think we know where the big breakthrough is going to come or whether it's going to be an aggregate of a number of things. I wish I could get up here and tell you there's a silver bullet and it'll be here tomorrow. Um, but, you know, part, I mean, echoing what Nick said, we know that human beings are not great elements. We like to be nice people. We want to get our jobs done. There's a lot of things that we balance day to day between you know, following our corporate policies, whatever they are, and, and getting the work done and helping our coworkers. I think, and there's a, d a great deal of debate of whether or not we need to try to educate people better in terms of cybersecurity, or we need to give up on that and try to limit the damage that can be done. I tend to fall more in that later camp in that we need better tools that don't rely on people remembering 20 character passwords with four digits in them, right? I mean, this is just sort of getting silly. We need to figure out how to sort of adapt to the fact that human beings are not great computers. They're human beings. Other things that we're looking on tend to be, you know, a little bit more process oriented. Um, you know, I think one of the things Scott brought up is can we sort of segregate things off? Do we have high value assets that we want to put in one place and really try to isolate a little bit from the hundreds or thousands of employees who maybe don't need as much access to them so that when they break into a, a laptop on an employee's desk, this doesn't give them the keys to the kingdom. This is a little bit of a mindset from you know, having a perimeter to having a little bit more of an internal architecture we've gotten so big. And then finally, I'll mention we have a great deal of work to do in the, the legal and the policy space. Uh, one of the big challenges we have right now, and you mentioned you know, organized criminals from Eastern Europe and other countries, unlike crimes that happen physically in Indianapolis, say, we are very limited in our ability to actually go out and have a, an effect on the criminals. It's hard to catch them, and it's hard to punish them when we get there. So I think there's going to be a mix of technical, legal, sociological and what all sort of call you know design factors that go into whatever the next solution is yeah absolutely and a great point there I think the the creation of these sort of honey pots of information tend to be very attractive targets back to the the Robert quote right that's where the money is uh, you know does your secretary need the same access to all the customer information and sales information and data that you do or that the president of the company needs uh, probably not and so how can you coordinate that off Nick? Um, I, I think what we really all need to do, and, and you, know, you should promise yourself that today you'll start this process, we all need to be much better individual consumers and demand more. Um, open up your wallets. And if, if you don't have a card that has a chip on it, um, it, you might as well just leave your numbers out there, just pan them out because that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a poor uh, version of the uh, chip and pin process that's in, in Europe. We should be insisting that the credit card companies actually do take the responsibility for it. That's to Scott's point. It's all been pushed and shoved back at us. And sure, after the fact, somebody's like uh, Home Depot is going to send you a, a link so you can go to Clear ID, and, and then they'll tell you if somebody's looking at your account. Well, that doesn't feel very comfortable to me. So what we've been doing is actually going to uh, credit uh, card companies and saying, when, what are your plans for these? 
And uh, we've been making a list of the ones that say it's too expensive because they won't be getting my business anytime soon and certainly won't be getting the, uh, the company's business. Uh, you've got to be better educated and, and you don't have to be technicians, you don't have to be you know, cyber Jedi, you just have to think to yourself, you know, I know I keep on using that same password over and over again. Um, d don't be afraid of writing it down if that's what you need, but don't leave what you write down somewhere that somebody's going to find it, like stuck underneath your keyboard. Um, <laughs> you, and and you, you know what? You're laughing. I bet we can work number outside one and find them right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, pe people uh, use passwords that they, they, um, they construct from what they, they are. So, you, you know, if you social engineer and you walk into a cube, somebody's a Colts fan, there's a very good chance that Blue's in there somewhere or Peyton or some other thing. But that's not the point. Those pass passwords have, have long since sailed past the, their usefulness and past phrases are much better. If you want to be stronger, think of some, some phrase and insert random characters, uh, numbers in there. So, you know, the rain in Spain, change a couple of the, uh, the, the S for a five and you'll remember it's a lot better, it's a lot stronger. So if they do, if they do capture a file of um, passwords, Yours is going to be 30 or odd characters long. It's going to take a heck of a long time to crack. But um, just, just to frighten you even more, all the computing power you'd ever need to crack very, very strong passwords is available from Amazon on the web services. You, you, can, you can buy the computing power, the compute power, as it's now called, to be able to do that. So again, be afraid. Be very, very afraid. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think uh, largely avoiding making yourself the easiest of targets is probably a good practice across the board. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe they go on to somebody else. Real quick on the credit card, I don't know if a lot of people realize the European system, my understanding, is completely different in yes. terms of credit card technology and most importantly, the security available. But we don't have that in the U.S. Right. Why? So, they, the, um, well, the, the reason we don't have it is because the credit card companies are telling us it's too expensive, which means that they don't care about the breach at the end and it's somebody else's problem. Uh, so the way that the chip and pin works in Europe is it's the, the identity is proven, uh, typically speaking, in three ways. Something you have, something you are, and something you know. Um, and the, the something you have in this case is your credit card. Something uh, you are would be a, a particular other kind of token in that process. Uh, and then the, the other one's the PIN number. Well, the theory is to keep them all separated for as long as you possibly can and, and in fact, never send them uh, in the same transaction together. So the PIN is something that uh, you insert your card into a reader that's given to you um, and that you put your PIN into. Uh, it, it verifies with the chip that's actually on the um, credit card and that transaction doesn't go anywhere. That's just between that reader and that card, and that makes it inherently a lot more safe. Um, remember as well that, uh, I think Vaughan mentioned it before, uh, it is important to choose uh, services where you know that um, transactions like that are going to be encrypted, and not all of them are. So if you're, if you're engaging uh, with uh, banking on your uh, supercomputer in your pocket, uh, please be aware that when they send you something uh, in an SMS message, it's entirely unclear. It's entirely unclear. When they send you your uh, bank balance and such like, entirely unclear. So um, don't, I don't bank on my phone. I wouldn't dream of doing it. And even the fact that, that uh, Google and Apple are going to uh, encrypt uh, devices, that doesn't help me much because at some point that's going to travel in clear over the phone services. So be aware. Yeah, so uh, that's a great point. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, um, technological solutions and all that, but a lot of the, the onus for protecting people's selves doesn't go to the credit cards who have the money to, to create this new system that everybody knows is secure and the technology is already there and existing and developed and completely fine. We turn on like that, but they do have really good lobbying groups, right, to, to prevent the ability to do that. And it just keeps pushed, getting pushed down and down and down to the people who don't have great lobbying groups, which is, you know, me as an individual, you as an individual and all that. So I guess, Vaughn, let's get your thoughts started with you in terms of sort of this structure that we've organized, particularly in this country, where the responsibility for the cybersecurity of everyone and the protection of all their information lies on your shoulders and your shoulders alone, and you probably don't know much about it. I think we've done it in a pretty mishmash sort of a way. Um, you know, and I, I would disagree with Nick a little bit. I, as an individual consumer, 
I don't spend any time worrying about my credit card. There's a few things in life that's actually sort of easier than getting a new credit card issued to me. Uh, now you start talking about maybe a debit card actually. One of the reasons why debit cards are cheaper is because actually the liability concerns. There's more liability on me when I use a debit card than a credit card. And so you can sort of see this spectrum of liability. Probably the worst offender, by the way, in, in my thinking, is social security numbers. And the analogy I like to think of is what if somebody told, came to you and told you, by the way, your home phone number is now going to be your password and you can't change it for the rest of your life. This sounds like a pretty awful idea, but it's basically what we've done with social security numbers. For those of you who remember 20, 30 years ago in the 80s, I know when I went to school, it was my student ID number and I wrote it on, we had these things called checks, and I wrote it on every time, every time I wrote a check. Right, and these things were public identifiers and now somehow we've made them the keys to my identity kingdom. Somewhere in there, we lost a lobbying battle with somebody and we took all the liability. So some of this is we've had the deck stacked against us in some very serious ways. Um, you know, and I think we're still sort of sorting all this out. You know, we've had now breaches, 40 million, 60 million credit cards, and you know, society hasn't come to an end, maybe now it's the end of it. Now Scott here is sitting on my medical information, at least some of it. That's a little bit more concerning to me because that's not as easily replaced. And so some of these things I look at as, you know, how big is the actual convenience to me? Now if I'm a small business owner, my risk changes. And I think this is one of the things you have to be very conscious of is what context you're thinking of these things. And if I'm sitting on a pile of credit cards, if my reputation is at stake, if I am looking at fines if I have breaches, and this becomes a very different matter and these things do change wildly from person to person. So I think somewhere in all this we need to sort of look at and we're figuring out what's really important right now. These are big numbers we're throwing around 40 million, 70 million. You know, at the end of the day, how important are these and where do we really focus our effort? I think is a key question that we're still answering. Scott, your perspective as a, a guy who's sort of heading up the technology at a large organization, how much of that do you want on you and how much do you want on individuals? Um. In the, in the corporate context, I think that you have to elevate it to the level of, you have to elevate it to the level of the people that are there to protect you. As individuals, um, I think I agree with Nick from the perspective of, it's, it's all about you becoming savvy about taking responsibility for your own security. Um, you know, the, the only challenge that I see to um, I, I agree that you know credit cards and minor identity thefts and things like that. That we've we've as a society made it very easy to uh, very easy to mitigate those as an individual. But there's an interesting thing. I was looking at an article about four weeks ago. You may, uh, I don't know if anybody's read about this, but so you know how you can uh, like the saber thing go online and they'll they'll trawl all the other sites um, and put together all of your possible airline options and things like that and the cheapest you can get them and all of that. So, uh, people who have done cyber theft are now doing that. Where, so what we're seeing now is breaches breed breaches. So they've created meta programs where they go through and they look at the data that's been gathered and you know they're putting together data warehouses where they right. can go through and go, oh, on this day we got Nick's mother's maiden name and then from over here we got his address and wow we've got a social here and they actually go through all of that and put that together and now you've got a new now you've got a new breach where they can you know for somebody like Nick or me they can elevate their permissions grab your hash and then they've got you mm -hmm. um, and they've really got you at that point um, so I think we tend to look at both at the individual and the corporate level uh, we tend to look at each breach in its own isolation, and I think we're now seeing, starting to see where that's not the case. Um, so, I, I mean, I think at the corporate level, you hire people typically um, to take care of that, to, to be the experts in that, and so you have to rely on those and make sure that they're they're doing what you need them to do. At the individual level, you kind of have to have that little part of your brain that's your uh, your security officer and it's it's we tend to do that thing where we go well we're not technologists but I mean it, it adheres to general design principles don't build 40 doors in your house you know don't you know from a from a metaphorical standpoint so in other words 
can try and limit the number of vectors that people can come in and things like that. Yep. There, there, there's an intuitive level where you can still be good at that, whether you feel you're a technologist or not. Yep. I, I think that I think the key is a partnering. That's what I'm <laughs> I'm really trying to advocate for you here today. I, I think you've got to know um, up and down the chain. Uh, Scott mentioned it before that you know you are inherently in security. The, you are only as secure as your weakest link and we've, everything we've talked about today whether it's coming in through an HVAC system or, or something like that you're only as secure as that so infrastructure itself is is a, a very um, a very willing participant in uh, these these uh, crimes because um, technology itself is is quite vulnerable uh, because it needs to be patched all the time it needs to be configured and looked after and honestly, um, uh, misconfigurations are probably uh, as much a, a, an issue as a, a, an organization being hacked. But that then falls back on, on the, the users of those technologies to keep on patching it. We should be looking for partnerships and models that, um, w where the technologies are inherently more secure. And the models are out there. And, and, you know, and Paul could probably uh, talk for about four or five hours on the the security models that are, could be built into technology, the, the, you know, the, the rings and things to protect a device. But once you plug one device into another, you begin to change the dynamics of it and then you plug something else in and so on. And, and the, the internet is not a homogenous thing. It's, it's all those things. Um, it, it, we've, we've got to be serious about it, I think is my, is my message. And, and you should educate, you should look to partners, uh, organizations. You, if you've got health information in your system somewhere, you are covered or should be covered by a, a, a HIPAA um, regulation. Whether you intentionally got that stuff or not, you, if you've got it, guess what? You're covered by it and you, you need to have a process for finding those kinds of things out in your organization. And if you don't ha have a need for that data, you should not collect it. If you don't have a need to hold somebody's credit card and, and other stuff like that, you should not collect it. And you should certainly have the duty and the care to look after it as described by PCI regulations or in the case of healthcare, HIPAA. But you need to know. And the only way you're gonna know is by looking at your systems, scanning your systems in the same way that hackers do to determine what information you've got and what you are um, um, owing somebody a, a duty of care for. So that's, that definitely brings up a couple points I want to get to today. And we've got several questions here, one of which is from Purdue Tech Park. Hello, West Lafayette. Uh, biometrics, fingerprint scanners on phones, these kinds of technologies that you're really seeing come more into the mainstream with iPhones and things like that. How secure are they? What are they adding to the mix? I mean, this gets you beyond the, the password. This gets you beyond the passphrase. This is in here. You know, uh, what are the security elements surrounding those kinds of technologies? It depends entirely on how they're implemented. Um, you know, the, the, the Let's use the iPhone as an example. Well, the, that's your transaction between you and it, so that's, that's pretty damn secure. It's not going off anywhere. It isn't stored anywhere else but on your phone. But, it, you know, your phone is not then um, encrypted, so you know, it, it would be available if somebody got your phone and, and they would then... I'm doing this, cut them, and you can't see me on the phone, but I'm waving my finger around because this is the finger I use to control my iPad. Um, the, 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 the sort of retina scans and things like that are also very secure as long as the data behind it, as in the checking one thing against the other, is secure. Um, it's, not the, it's not the process between it and the device, it's the process between the device and whatever it's checking for that authentication. That's, that's the weak link and that's what needs to be protected. So, Nick, you also touched on the concept of if, if you don't need it, don't collect it. Right. And so uh, I think everybody probably heard that, well, as part of, uh, I think it's part of iOS 8. It's, at some point, Apple, within the last couple of weeks, has basically announced, you know, we're a hardware company. We make these things. We make, you know, uh, all these devices that go together. We are not what other companies are, which are essentially advertising companies. Mm -hmm. We exist to collect your data and then sell it every which way that we can. And our product is the advertisement. Our product is not the phone. Apple has, has taken a dramatic, I think, uh, course shift, at least in their, their public-facing technologies here, in, in that they are saying now, you know, okay, if the government's going to come in through backdoor, maybe, maybe not. If other people are going to get hacked in, we're taking the position that we're going to encrypt these phones, uh, and we don't have your data. 
So you can go get all the subpoenas you want from a judge and bring them to me and say, here's a subpoena, hand it over. Apple's going to say, I don't have it. What about that, Vaughn, in terms of uh, a change in strategy? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of government pushback from that. There's sort of a, a PR campaign, really, from the government saying how terrible this is because we're enabling criminals to do this. You know, I, I think there's two things going on there. First, I think the, the push is very good. You know, we've talked about insider threats forever in cybersecurity, and we're realizing now one, one of the insider threats in any company is essentially, you know, kind of getting a subpoena or other legal pressure on the company to make it essentially turn against itself in some ways. And so companies are now understanding that and trying to build in those sorts of safeguards. And then, Brian, you're actually right. There's a, there's a tension here between that and law enforcement that goes back to the 90s. For those of you who remember, there was the clipper chip debate back in the 90s where the government wanted to put you know, this sort of backdoor into, into hardware. Uh, the problem with that is I think the, the motives there are very good. The realistic issue is we don't know how to do backdoors yet really securely. We don't know how to put a backdoor in that we make sure only law enforcement can access and the criminals in Eastern Europe can't. And backdoors add complication, which is the root cause of all this problem. So th this is a trade-off of to whether or not we want to be more secure in mass. Do we want each one of our iPhones for the millions of people who have it to be that much more secure? Or do we want to have a little bit easier process for law enforcement in a few cases where this encryption is really the blocker? There, there's no silver bullet that solves both of those problems right now. And so it's this trade-off that we're wrestling with. Right now, my personal feeling is the woes of the millions outweigh those few cases. And I think we as a society are better off by protecting all the privacy of these individual iPhones than we do for handling a few corner cases, which are unfortunate, but we have to look at the bigger picture. Yeah, and that's a point, right? There, there is no such thing as the cyber criminal only phone or the right. version of the iPhone, right? They use the exact same devices that we use. They carry the same phones. They use the same software. They're just better at it. Much better at it. Yeah. Well, and, and they, they're educated. I think, you know, right. one of the larger points of, uh, of this uh, panel today is education and the importance of that. And, you know, you've got a bunch of people carrying around tracking devices in their pockets 24 hours a day all the time. You I've seen statistics about the amount of time people spend with their iPhone versus their spouse or their children, and it's, right. it's ridiculous, right? So you're carrying this tracking device around with you at all times. They know what they can do with it. They know how to get into it, and largely right. people don't. Well, so I, I heard the I was kind of making a mental note until I heard the word, and and Vaughn's the first person to to use it today, and that's privacy. Um, um, you know, we have a, a right to privacy. We really do, and so I'm very much in favour of. Uh, the data being encrypted, uh, both in uh, at rest and in transmission. It's not that I, I'm doing anything. Um, uh, I'm, I live a very boring life most of the time. <laughs> um, but I, I just don't choose to share it with the rest of the world. And uh, I, I, think, I think that's a, a maxim that's, that's sort of lost itself in, our, uh, in people posting everything on the, in the world out there. So, for me, encrypt away. I, I, I'm very happy about that. And I, I, I echo what Vaughan said. It's, it, it is a, an incumbent to some of the, uh, uh, the police efforts. But we'll figure that out. But encrypt away right now. I think you have to be a little bit careful there, Nick, because I think there's two concepts that are easy to conflate there. I mean, we see a lot of, particularly youth, posting a lot of things on Facebook and online that we wouldn't. And we see this as an erosion of privacy. Uh, I've heard one person argue it's really more an expression of hubris than it is an erosion of privacy. They think people are very interested. They want to share more with the world. But in general, what we found is people are more interested in control of what they share. And the fact that some people may share wildly different things is an erosion of privacy into itself. What's the erosion of privacy is how much we can individually control what we share. Mm -hmm. You may decide to share much less than I do. You may decide much less to share than my, my nieces and nephews and so forth, but having that control. The hard part is less than, I think, what we individually share and what's encrypted is it's sort of when we start looking at our actions in mass, what sites we visit, sort of the metadata argument that comes in. So it's less what I choose to expressively do and more what you can sort of do by looking at what I do in the aggregate, what sites I visit when I choose to do things online. And that, that gets into a harder thing that, that we're wrestling with and, you know, Things like encryption don't help so much there as it becomes legal policy controls and not keeping that data. You know, we have this, boy, I just want to keep everything on all my users so I know what they're doing. You know, and the problem is, is that can be misused 
maybe not by you, but by somebody else, as we've seen. And it's an argument you'll hear a lot where, oh, I lead a boring life, there's nothing on there, I don't care if they see it. Well, you know, you still lock your door, you still have doors, right. you still close the curtains at night when you go to bed. It's not the act of hiding something uh, or that you're doing anything wrong or illegal. It's giving yourself the choice to have that privacy. If you can't have it in your own home, if you can't have it on your own device anymore, where can you have it? Let's transition a bit here. We've got several questions, and, and this is certainly a topic that I know that we all wanted to get into. Um, cloud. Scott didn't run out the door, so I think we're, <laughs> we're better now. Why don't you kick us off in terms of a perspective of businesses moving data information to the cloud, challenges, issues that arise there? Um, so when we stood up our data centers, we actually architected everything as an internal cloud, um, and then we're aware of the public cloud. Um, I think when most people talk about this, they're talking about the public cloud. Um, my point on that would be give yourself an option. Um, we evaluate everything that we implement as to whether it's better to put it out in the cloud or whether to bring it into the internal cloud. And one of those evaluations is we feel like on certain things we can provide a, a greater amount of security right now. Um, Nick made a good point uh, whenever we talk about this, which is um, the technologies are advancing very rapidly in the public cloud. Um, and one of the neat things about that is, is you're only exposed for the duration of your transaction. Whereas if I stand up a host and I have to externally present it because the university wants to get to it, another hospital wants to get to it or something like that, that's, that's always on. So, um, I think that, I think there was a visceral reaction for the last really five years, particularly from the security sector to, it's cloud, we don't own it, it's, you know, bring it inside. I don't know, you know, in the context of our, our larger topic of how things are changing, I don't know that that's going to remain the case in the coming probably five to ten years. I think you're going to find that more and more you get some security tools that are harder to implement in your own data center by looking at cloud solutions for certain key data. Um, and then obviously that puts a big onus on the policy, of, you know, which we've not talked a lot about at all, you know, your business associate agreements and things like that, of, hey, what are you doing with my data? Kind of brings us back to the how long are you going to keep it and dealing with that at, at, at that level or right. not so necessarily a technological level. Right. So I'm, a, I'm actually a huge fan of what's happening with uh, cloud technology. Um, so just for a definition, there, I mean, there are about uh, five, five criteria for what, what you'd look at for a service to judge whether you were dealing with the cloud or not. One of them is, is that there's some kind of metering associated with it, a pay by, the click or whatever, but then there's also the, the fact that uh, it could be expanded, the service can be expanded, conversed, and, and so on and so forth. But, or bore you with all of that. But what I like about it is that it means that that uh, smaller businesses, the people that uh, Scott was referring to before, the partners that need it, can be, if they choose the right services, one heck of a lot better off infrastructurally than they could ever be by trying to build and assemble it themselves. And, they, and the, more importantly, if you choose the right partners, you don't have to run it, you can concentrate on your business so you don't have to have half of your business being either uh, to do with uh, IT or then you have to grow the, uh, the IT security to, to look after it. I like the cloud and, I, and I like, I'd like people to invest a lot more in it so that we can be, uh, from those kind of points of view, inherently um, more technologically advanced and, and therefore, if we choose the right partners, um, more secure. The federal government has a program and it's out there, you can look at it, it's called FedRAMP. R-A-M-P, Fed RAM, and uh, the uh, Amazon cloud solution is actually certified for use in federal solutions. So it is possible, and all the people who've been running around with their hair on fire, um, it's, it's very possible to use the cloud, and the Feds are doing it. What about this concept, Vaughn, of if you're not the customer, you're the product? Free services versus paid services, you know, can I put my sensitive, uh, financial information from my customers into Dropbox? Is it different if I use a different service? Uh, what you're starting to see consumer market-wise is a lot of companies uh, not competing on sucking in your data, right, but competing on privacy as a, as a feature uh, that they use to justify uh, selling, you know, selling you products that instead of giving away for free and collecting all your data and selling ads, 
you know, pay me 10 bucks a month and here we go. Yeah, so I, I'm a big advocate of, of risk management and understanding when you look at one thing, you're not looking at one thing, you're looking at a choice between two things. And so in some sense here, I, I agree with what Nick and Scott have said, you know, we're looking at a choice here between putting things in the cloud or running them ourselves. And for those of you who've gone out and tried to hire security people like I do, you know, that can be a tough market. Um, so the, then this question of whether or not you're paying for a service with money or you're paying for it with yourself as the product is an interesting one. And, and people do make interesting choices on that. Um, you know, I go back, I disagree with, with Nick a little bit. I don't think we do ourselves a lot of service by going out and telling people don't use Facebook. I mean, Facebook's now the sixth largest country in the world. This is kind of like telling people don't travel to Europe. I think we lose some credibility when we do that. They're going to do these sorts of things. I think what we need to do is have a better, you know, give them a better understanding of what the risks are that, that they're undertaking when they do that. And in some sense, I think it comes back to that question of how do we make some of these things like my mother's maiden name kind of less important in the world. So, but I agree with you, we are definitely making a trade-off there when we do something like Facebook and we are selling ourselves instead of giving them, them $10 a month. Uh, on the other hand, it's what people want. And I think this is a reality of the, the new world that, that we live in is that people want to be connected, they want to share, they want to take advantage of this internet that we have. And it's going to be up to us to some sense adjust to that, that new world order than I think rather than try to fight against that storm. Well, that's why there are um, actual um, solutions popping up right now that are uh, designed for people to share and solutions where they absolutely are, are saying they will not, uh, they will not uh, let the information, they'll secure the information, they'll look after the information and they won't sell people into ads. I think it's called LO or something similar. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, there are people who, who, who don't disagree with me and that they, they believe that that's probably how it should be. Don't get me wrong, I like sharing. I really do. I just like to make, make sure that uh, the things that I share are the things that I intended to share. Because uh, again, another problem with uh, Facebook is that you are inherently at the risk of the least secure setting of anybody who's in your mix. You can think that you've set yourself up and you've been aware, but the least secure person in your whatever the heck it's called these days, your friends, um, they, they, are, they are your weakest link. So I, I, I want to get to this question because I like it. Should yeah. anybody be on Facebook, question mark, ever, question mark? <laughs> well, I, honestly, if it, was, if it was left to me, I, I would have left it alone. I, I, I don't like the business because of the way it began as well. And, uh, and for those of you who don't know, it was, it was actually created so that... Um, a group of uh, men could judge women. I find that um, absolutely ha ha heinous. I really dislike it intensely. So it's been downhill from there for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you Farmville, could, Nick. You can build a digital farm. So there. I, uh, you know. It's <laughs> awesome. I, I love that. But you, you could have also p played a cow clicker, which I think was <laughs> one of the most uh, tremendous things. Just a, a quick diversion. Dave. A guy invented this game called Cow Clicker to try and judge what it was that people wanted out of things like that. And, and literally all they had to do was to keep clicking on their cows and the cows would be happy as long as they were being clicked on. And uh, then he allowed them to... Billion dollar idea yeah, there. He allowed them to... He allowed them, well, no, no he was, he was cl just collecting data. Then he allowed them to buy more cows and, and, and so on and so forth. And then finally uh, he announced that, the, that uh, Cowmageddon was coming. <laughs> and uh, the, the, it was the end of these cows, and, and sure enough, they all they're all uh, waiting for them, they're talking to one another online, and uh, Calmageddon came through, and the cows disappeared, but the cow shadows were left, and uh, people carried on clicking on the cow shadows, and and the comments were things like, "Oh, I, it was much better when the cows were here." Yeah. So you know, if that's what you're dealing with <laughs> online, uh, you've so, got more problems than Facebook. I, more time than you need. We've got about I, I think five minutes left. Is that right, Andy? Yeah? Okay. We're going to go with that. Thank you, Deb. Um, a couple, like, quick-fire consumer questions, and then let's, let's close it out with giving some people some practical tips in terms of, I own a business. Where do I start? There's so much going on. Cookies. Should I use, in my internet browser, the cookies to save my passwords so that I don't have to log in every time I go to a website? Yes. Yes? No problem? Every time you're typing your password in somewhere, I mean, this is actually how a phishing attack occurs. And I think it's one of the ways we technically got the internet wrong. Is, you know, if you think about it, 
you do a, bus a, a business relationship. You spend a lot of time at first deciding what bank you want to use. Then every time, you, then once you establish that relationship with the bank, it's a much lighter weight procedure. You go in, they know you, you know them. Right? We put all the effort up front. Unlike the internet, where what we decide to do is every time you go there, you're typing a username and password. Having that cookie actually takes your password, which is the more sensitive thing, and you're typing it less, you have less likelihood of typing it into the wrong site and falling for a phishing attack. So by having that, I, I think it's actually one of the better defenses we have. Incognito mode, private browsing mode in browsers. Sure, yeah. What does that do exactly? It stops the track. It, well, it stops tracking cookies as opposed to saved data for use in, on the browser. Mm -hmm. It stops those kind of things. Yeah. And there's a very good service called LastPass, which can kind of be a halfway house between your browser saving it and it's a service that it's saved. They, it's encrypted. They don't see it and you can use that that way as well. That was another question. For those not familiar, there's all sorts of companies, LastPass, Dashlane, there's others like that. Essentially, you come up with one really good, usually very long password. It stores everything in a supposedly encrypted vault. You can use that to sort of manage your passwords. It'll generate sort of gobbly good passwords for you so you don't have to remember them. And services like that are, are good, and I think everybody would consider generally useful. And here's one totally hypothetical, I'm sure, but we're going to ask it anyway. What do I do if I lose my cell phone that has my info on it, hypothetically? Well, it depends on what Nobody your cell phone really is. lost their cell phone, right? I mean, it depends on what cell phone you're using. Exactly, right, right. I mean, you can remotely scrub certain, I mean, again, this is back to being a good consumer. I would never buy a cell phone that I couldn't remotely scrub yep. right, if it was lost. Right. So know that when you go out to buy a cell phone. Start with turning on the pin code, right? right. I mean, <laughs> if you don't have it on, people, anybody can get in your phone immediately. Right. Start there and make yourself a little more difficult. Right. This comes back to the, you know, be prepared for something bad to happen. Which exactly. That's what we need to do. And, yeah, don't buy a cell phone without thinking about what you're going to do if you lose it. And I think that's true and, and goes into businesses, too. When you're giving your employees laptops and they're taking them home with them, make them have a password on it. Make, you know, run some kind of disk encryp encryption on it. Um, you know, the simple things that you can do listening to, to you gentlemen seems to be largely effective still. I mean, theft. Uh, phishing attacks, people sending emails, educate your employees about clicking on links. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that'll get you, not all the way, but a lot of the way towards making your organization more secure, making your, your organization's data a lot more secure. Uh, you know, if you can get 90% of the way uh, there, you're doing better than most people, I would say. What are some other, as we close up here, other sort of practical tips, uh, pearls of beautiful wisdom you want to bestow upon our business owners in the crowd uh, as they head out the door. There's so much going on. Where do we start? Um, I'd certainly tell you to, to educate uh, your family as best you can. I don't just mean your kids. I mean, my, uh, one of my best things was to educate my mother, who went from being a Luddite to being a, a fiendish consumer of the internet, but uh, a very insecure one. So we fixed that quite quickly. Um, but it, there are a lot of very good um, resources freely available so um, those of you who are on the edge of geekdom you can go and look at the stuff that's from NIST. did we make a, a list? we haven't mentioned it no okay. go ahead so there is a there is a list of um, uh, urls that i put together and we can send that out to to these this group so NIST is, is the uh, the standards um, they have some very uh, well uh, written ones uh, you can go all the way down into deep dive you, you don't have to but it, the principles are there uh, as an organization, uh, as a, a small business, if you want to carry out a, a risk um, management assessment, and you should, uh, Vaughan's entirely correct, uh, there's a, a tool from uh, Carnegie Mellon called Octave, and that's freely available, and it's very, very good, and very simple, and you should institutionalize its process. Um, uh, information risk management is here. You need to use it. Yeah, and just on that point, NIST, it's N-I-S-T, Google, or Perform an internet web search for <laughs> NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. Essentially, it's a public-private partnership, I believe, that came together and created sort of a set of standards. You know, here's five tiers of security or whatever it was, and, you know, if you're not doing anything, here's where you can start it. It's a good practical way to begin to think about and walk through these things. Uh, so NIST cybersecurity framework. Scott? Um, if you're large, uh, this is all about the relationship between somebody like Vaughn and somebody like me, really that's almost like the litig litigious relationship between a prosecutor and you know, security is making sure the people that should have access have access all the time and making sure the people that don't, shouldn't have access don't have access. 
you really only get to that right place if you have somebody who is dedicated to prosecuting the case of the security and somebody who's also dedicated to and they work together that's how you find that right place in the middle if you're small band together right and you'll all have some sort of either group or person that's your IT person go out and get you somebody like Nick or partner up with somebody like Vaughn um, and create that relationship among your consortium because that's the single most important thing because the security landscape is going to constantly change so unless that's the great place where humans are good computers we're really adaptable make sure that you have that relationship in place between your operations person and your whoever's watching your security and that's how you find the right middle big finish uh, I'll second what these gentlemen said for you know time and effort simplest thing if I'm a small business owner which I was for a while we didn't get into how FDIC treats small businesses different than individuals your banking becomes much more important just think about a simple thing costs a little bit more have a separate computer that you use just for online banking you know keep your web browsing keep your Facebooking if you choose to do it off of it just have one that sits in the corner use it for online banking and that's that's a really simple way it just comes down to you know and it's sort of an air gap well, very good I think uh, we're out of time here so if you could all join me in, in thanking these gentlemen for their time today Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.